Okay, hello everyone. I think it's a good time to start the the Make Your Group for this for this nice Friday afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have an amazing speaker here, and this is sort of in the role of uh, uh, speakers in our Make Your Group. Um, we're trying to get a good, good mix of junior speakers, senior speakers, speakers from all corners of experiences in the world, and. Um, Jesse has been with MIT before, and I think Maria can can attest to that in her in her introduction to to Professor Jesse uh, Austin Brenneman. So Maria, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Matthias. Um, so I am delighted to introduce our speaker today, Jesse Austin Brenneman. He is an assistant professor of mechanical engineering and the founder and director of the Global Design Lab at the University of Michigan. Um, Jesse did his bachelor's at MIT in ocean engineering. And he did his um, PhD and master's with me, I'm very proud to say, uh, under an NSF and a Ford Foundation fellowship. Um, and then he did a postdoc with myself and Amos Winter. Um, Jesse is a rising star whose groundbreaking research is focused on new approaches to complex system design that combine design and engineering approaches um, to uh, <laughs> uh, methodologies with field-based ob observations that help us rethink grand challenges in areas such as sustainable transportation and sustainable product life cycles in emerging global markets. Um, this has led to fundamental new insights about how to tackle complex social technical systems that defy single discipline solutions. And um, I'd like to add that his inspiring uh, efforts as a design educator have been recognized by a 2020 ASME Ben Sparks Medal. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jesse Austin Brenneman. I'm going to clap here. I know you can't clap, but I am. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the only one that can add audio, so I'll clap there. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to share my screen now, if that's OK. We'll do that. Thank you very much for that introduction, Maria. I'm very happy to be back uh, virtually here in Cambridge uh, to, to give this talk. Um, and I'm excited to, to have some interaction and, and talk about some of the issues and sort of big challenges that we're thinking about in my research and in my research group and our approach and how we might improve that and collaborate and, and sort of have synergies with uh, all of you here in the audience. So love to have that interaction, whether during the talk or afterwards. Um, so today my talk's gonna be about designing better complex systems. And uh, as Maria alluded to, I'm going to be talking about uh, mobility solutions and developing economies. Um, and again, I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, you guys already covered my background, so I won't go too much into it, but I was course 13, so I did uh, work on UAVs down uh, at Woods Hole at one point, was very excited to get the opportunity to do that. Uh, then I worked with D-Lab, uh, got the opportunity to go to Peru and be a development engineer with some NGOs through uh, contacts that I made through D-Lab. And then uh, was lucky enough to be both do a PhD with Maria and also be a Tata Center postdoctoral fellow with Amos and Maria. Uh, and that's us in India, uh, you know, working on these types of engineering systems and artifacts, but thinking about their impact in the broader system. And that's what I really want to talk to you about today is thinking about, um, you know, in my current research, that's all built up to this idea of how do we really understand these sort of system level outcomes when we're designing these artifacts or pieces of the system. So the motivating question for my research group that sort of has built up over time, I feel like I've been working to my, my whole career is how do we create solutions with sustainable impact? And those are some important words that have a lot of meaning. So I wanna get into sort of some of the definitions of those. And really I'm a design theory and methodology person. So I do design process. And a lot of that in engineering is about how do we go from these abstract user needs to these concrete user specifications. And in the, in the literature, there's a rich body of literature that looks into formal strategies for doing that. So for example, you have seminal work by Paul and Bites, this is a very classic textbook that says, here's how you go from these user needs to engineering specifications. You start with planning and clarification, you go through conceptual embodiment and detailed design. There are a lot of these design process models out there for people to take advantage of. Now, how might that look in, in, you know, in real life? Well, you might start by thinking about, well, we have some problem commuters. We have these commuters here that you know, are having trouble doing that last mile. There's a, their subway stop is not quite where they need it to be. And so you might go through this process of formal strategy. And then, sorry, the Zoom, I was trying to close the Zoom chat box. You might go through that and then come up with, hey, here's this new idea, electric scooters. We could have this fleet of electric scooters, and this could really solve our last mile transportation problem, right? 
So you would do that by going through this design task. And in time, if we look at that within time, you would start with this needs identification, do our design methods, whether it's Paul and Bice or any other method that you wish to use. And uh, just to be precise about my language, I'm gonna say design methods, I'm gonna use Nigel Cross's definition, which are any tool or procedure to help decision-making to achieve a desired outcome in engineering. And when you go through that process, you then get to the outcome where you sell or implement the system. But in my research group, what we're really interested in is what happens after you sell it, right? So after the person purchases this artifact, what happens while they are using it? And the reason for that is because all of the sustainability outcomes really are realized, any potential benefit that you get is realized through the use of the artifact or system, right? So if we think about the axes of sustainability, we have economic impact, and this is the one we, we mainly think about in engineering, but we also think a lot about environmental impact and then finally social impact. And in fact, there are design strategies, these formal design strategies for trying to address each one of these axes. And I'm just gonna name one of them in each axis, but there are many. So for example, you might use design for market systems to try and predict how do my design decisions affect the potential economic impact. And then you might look at sustainable life cycle design for environmental impact. And although we're starting to get some work into social impact measures and, and metrics for trying to predict what the potential social impact is, this is an area that there's limited work in engineering uh, design methods. So in my research group, we look at those axes and we say, we wanna make decisions during the design process over here after we've identified the need and before we implement or produce the artifact or system. And we really wanna say, we know that those decisions affect the economic impact, affect the environmental impact and affect the social impact. And we wanna create ways of thinking about or understanding the potential impact of any design decisions that we make. So what are the challenges to doing that? Now, obviously everybody wants to do that. You can, we have things that look into life cycle design. We have things that do this already, but the challenges are number one, how do you define context? Right? So the reason that this is particularly difficult is that the potential sustainable outcomes are dependent on what the context that artifact or system is being used in. Right? So if you change what city you're in, the impact of a bird scooter sitting on the sidewalk is going to be different, right? Because the transportation systems are different. You can also, the scale and complexity are really difficult. So we're making these design decisions. I wanna design a scooter, but what is that impact at scale if I deploy this across a whole city? What is the potential social impact? What's the potential environmental impact? It's really hard to try and understand. Uh, another big challenge is human behavior. So we have people using these and the benefit and impact really depends on their usage by humans. And there's a lot of variation both within an individual over time, but also within a user population. And then finally, how do we validate these findings? So if your environmental impact or your social impact occurs five to 10 years from now, how do you validate that your decisions had any potential you know, impact on those outcomes? So that, that's another big challenge from a research perspective. So our approach is we really, again, the goal of all of our research, and we're gonna talk about sort of broad range of topics, but the goal of all of this research is to try and connect these design decisions. So if I'm designing the bird scooter, I wanna connect my design decisions on the dimensions, its functionality, its engineering specifications, to this network of stakeholders or this big scale system that's really complex. And these are all just other stakeholders that might be affected by your commute on the bird scooter. And so these are system level sustainability outcomes. And we wanna connect again, the, the big story here, the big idea is just, we wanna be able to connect design decisions we're making at sort of that individual level to potential impact at the system level. And so how do we do that? Well, the way that we, we approach all of the problems that we've worked on is to, to ground quantitative system modeling with qualitative interviews with the stakeholders. So what we really try and do is understand the behavior and values and objectives of the stakeholders through rigorous interviews and qualitative research, right? So we try and understand what is the system like? Who is in the system? How are they behaving? What's important to them? And in doing so, we can then pair that with other data that we collect in order to build a quantitative system model. And we do that to both determine what we're modeling, but also how we should be modeling it. 
And after we've grounded that and done some simulations, we do a lot of large scale simulations in my group. After we do those simulations, we then take those insights back to the stakeholders to try and validate like, hey, if we had this potential benefit, would it be something that you care about? And at the end of the day, really design is about value. And so we want to understand how does technical performance at that system level match with something that stakeholders value. So the research projects, uh, given that context, I'm now going to talk to you about two very different research projects that we did, but I think that are connected through this approach to trying to understand system level behavior. And that's really to use an understanding of the human stakeholders to explore the system behavior. And the two that I'm going to do uh, on the left here is a future modular transportation system. Um, that's actually not in the future. That's in Dubai right now. Uh, but we're going to be talking about a different concept that's also modular transportation. And the second project is going to be about informal e-waste recycling in northern Thailand. And so, again, we're trying to understand system level sustainability outcomes and how our design actions and decisions affect those outcomes. So in terms of future modular transportation, we collaborated with uh, a large multinational automaker. Uh, and what we were doing was they came to us with this idea of, well, modular transportation, we are starting to get the technology that's gonna enable us to do this for real. So modular transportation is an idea that has existed for a while. Um, there's a limited amount of research on it, mainly because you need a large level of connectivity in terms of connectedness to each vehicle in order to coordinate at a system level scale. And we're starting to get there with the technology. So they wanted to come to say, what is the potential sustainability impact or outcomes uh, in terms of economic, social, and environmental for a type of system? And the concept they brought to us was the one that you see here. And so this is a micro macro vehicle concept. The way that this works is that there are micro vehicles. Uh, these already exist. Um, so Toyota, a bunch of people make these battery operated electric vehicles, which are for one person uh, for use in cities. So these are at lower speeds, shorter distances, carry people. And then the idea was, is there any real potential benefit to having macro vehicles, which carry these micro vehicles and are optimized for higher speeds, longer distances? And one of the major constraints that they brought to us, they said, look, we really want to explore is there a medium term solution as we try to start to transition to autonomous vehicles, transition to connected vehicles, uh, where we don't have to make major changes to the infrastructure, right? So the existing residential roads would be what the micro vehicles travel on and the highways would be my macro vehicles tra travel on. In order to do that, we started by trying to understand the stakeholders in these transportation systems. So we did semi-structured interviews uh, throughout the year um, in which we talk to different stakeholders within the transportation system. So that's riders, people at transportation authorities, both private and public um, actors within this space. And the results from that really, uh, and I'm gonna try and synthesize a couple of them for you. There's really five things people care about. And this is a, a generalized thing that commuters care about is the availability, affordability, efficiency, convenience, and sustainability of any modality of transportation that they're going to use. So what does that mean? This, the true underlying story of transportation is in this graph, which is that it's a trade-off, your mode of transportation, your choice of the mode of transportation for any trip that you make, usually is a trade-off between flexibility and cost. And so if we think about the trade-off between a personal vehicle, which is what most people use, so something like 76 to 80% of people use their own vehicle to commute to work, and that number has stayed the same over the last 20 to 25 years, um, so most people choose the personal vehicle. And the reason for that is public transport is actually a lot cheaper. It's heavily subsidized usually. Um, and if you're in a major metropolitan area, owning a personal vehicle and driving it and parking it somewhere in, the, in that city while you go to work is actually really, really expensive. Um, the public transport, however, is not very flexible. So for a routine trip to work, you know, public transport really works. But if you have a non-routine thing, you wanna go to pick up your kid from school, they're sick, Maybe you have to go to a doctor's appointment. There's you want to go to some place that's not on your normal trip. It's actually really, really hard to do on public transport. And so there are three types of riders uh, that you can categorize through this. They're all purpose riders who, because it's financially irresponsible for them to own a vehicle, they use public transport for every trip. This is actually a big problem um, here in Southeast Michigan and Detroit. There are trips that people take for work that actually happen that take four hours. So there are people that work at the airport that take public transit for four hours each way. 
to get to work and then get home again. So eight hours out of their day is on public transportation. Um, there are choice riders who are people that just depending on the context, choose to use public transport or not. Some days to take the bus, some days to take the personal vehicle. And then there are people that are occasional riders. And these are people that use the personal vehicle for everything, except occasionally, let's say you had to go down, you know, go to Fenway, you want to catch a Sox game. Uh, you know, I'm going to throw in that, that Boston reference right there. You might take the green line. You're like, okay, let me just take the green line today. But for every other trip, so occasionally you take public transport, for other trip, you take, take the thing. So there really is this market opportunity when we look at these stakeholder interviews for understanding this trade-off between flexibility and cost. The other actor that came out of those interviews that's really important if you're gonna build a transportation system, a future one, and understand any potential impact are the transportation authorities. And so the three things that came out of those interviews were that um, they really have to serve multiple types of riders. So they have to do public transit riders, you have commuter shuttles or commuter rail in Boston, you also have uh, to be ADA compliant and get federal uh, highway money, you have to have a complementary paratransit. Um, and these, it's really expensive. You have to have different capital equipment, uh, so vehicles for these different types of riders. And it's quite costly to service all of them with this different equipment and different overhead. And they would really have a lot of benefit if you went to one system that was able to serve multiple types of users. The other thing that's really important about transportation right now, and this has only been accelerated by the pandemic, is there's a shifting demand in the way people work. So our current transportation systems are really set up to handle peak capacity, so rush hour. So our highways have enough lanes, our subways have enough capacities, our buses have enough frequency and capacity to handle that peak at the morning rush hour and the evening rush hour, right? Um, and that's much, much more than, than what's happening the rest of the day. Now, what's happening with how work is changing and people are working from home, People are working different hours. Nine to five is uh, less of a thing for a majority of the workforce. That peak is coming down and flattening out. So we have the shifting demand. This is a picture just of Ann Arbor, and it's going to come back later. So I just want you to understand the shape. This is the highways that ring around Ann Arbor. Um, the arrows represent the commuter flow at the beginning of the day. And so what you have is a shifting demand for that transportation authority throughout the day as different neighborhoods need to travel to work at different times. Right. And so you have this clustering where people, you know, throughout the day, you want to have your bus route be fixed. You have fixed infrastructure, but that capacity where you need the capacity changes throughout the day in the short term. It also changes in the long term. So you can see that the capacity difference between a metro system on the right and a city street is several orders of magnitude. Right. So a metro system you really want if you need that large to move large masses of people. Um, whether we're going to have to in the future in terms of pandemics, who knows, but we think that it'll go back, that all the stakeholders sort of felt it would go back to some sort of normal where people are riding public transportation, but for different types of cities, this really is too expensive. The metro system really is too expensive to try and implement. So you wanna have this flexibility of saying, okay, where do I build my stations or infrastructure uh, if I know that the demand and where the demand is going to be, where I'm going to need that capacity is changing not only on a daily basis throughout the day, but also on a yearly basis. So year over year, where that demand is can change drastically. So based on those insights, what we did was we took those and we wanted to set the modeling goal. So not only do we understand who, what stakeholders are in the system, I'll talk a little bit about some of the characteristics that we modeled from the qualitative interviews, but also what is the outputs that we care about? And so looking at these three axes of sustainability, again, people, the stakeholders really care about travel time and level of service and level of services. Can you even take the trip? Is there availability of a trip for you to go and get on a bus or get on a, a, a train to get to where you wanna go? In terms of environmental impact, people in the stakeholders, so the transportation authorities and riders mainly cared about congestion. And then in terms of social impact, there was a lot of discussion about transit equity or transportation equity. And this is the idea of access. So I talked to you earlier about how, uh, you know, certain neighborhoods in Detroit, you want to get to work, it might take you three to four hours. And that's, that's a real, that's not really a realistic option uh, for many people. And it's and a cost, a burden that's being placed on disproportionately on particular neighborhoods. So to ground the system model, we took all that information, we did that work to try and understand what is, what is the potential impact? What should we be trying to estimate? 
And then we did a transportation model and there are a lot of commercial transportation models available. We made our own agent-based model and I'll talk about why in a second. But what we wanted to do was again, what is the impact on these outcomes between passenger vehicles, which I'll call the status quo, and this micro macro concept that we that we were talking about before. We wanted to estimate those outcomes that we identified in the interviews. Now, one of the things that we set up our, our simulation to do was to track different types of trips and different types of households to try and understand some of those equity questions that we were, we were looking into, that the stakeholders cared about. Now, the system model is an agent-based model. We can get into the details uh, at questions or offline if you're interested, but we have car following. So what you can see here is that each trip, we, we create a demand model, which I'll talk about in a second, which says which trips need to happen throughout the day. And then each agent is assigned to taking that trip and they interact with all the other cars on the road. And each of these agents has particular characteristics depending on whether they're a passenger vehicle or a micro vehicle or a macro vehicle. And you can see that we've, we've put into our simulation, you know, it does car following, it, does, um, it, it listens to stoplights and intersections. Uh, so we don't have accidents. Now, that's, that's not very realistic. Obviously, there are accidents every day, uh, but in our system, there are no accidents. So you can see this is smoothly going on. And the other thing that we did was we made it so that you could take any map in Google Maps and draw a box and then generate a network map and simulation based off of that. And we did that because we wanted to be able to compare different contexts. And again, this is this idea that the sustainability or uh, outcomes depend on your context, and we wanted to be able to change that. Um, so the demand, the types of trips that were happening, where they start, where they go, the frequency of them uh, was stochastic and it was determined by the population density, the type of household. So over on the left, you don't need to care about the numbers. All that this is trying to show you is that these are different types of trips, whether you're picking or up or dropping off people, whether you're going to school, whether you're shopping or traveling to work. And the left bar is the distribution, the breakdown for the AM peak, so AM rush hour and PM rush hour. And that's just, again, to show you that throughout the day, that demand is shifting, right? And we wanted to be able to model that. Uh, we did about 900,000 trips. We calibrated that to other data we had about Southeastern Michigan. And the results that I'm gonna show you are for this afternoon peak. So between 2 p.m. and 2, 2 a.m. within that box that I was showing you that includes Ann Arbor and Dearborn, which is one of the major um, uh, suburbs of Detroit. So again, we're trying to compare this passenger vehicle to the micro macro vehicle concepts. And just to sort of, uh, the passenger vehicle it has a particular length, a particular top speed, and the, the dimensions and speeds of the macro micro vehicle we got from sort of existing vehicles that, that are out there in the market. So I'm just gonna show you uh, a little video of the status quo. So this is just passenger vehicles. The top is gonna to be a congestion map that we update throughout the day to see where congestion is. That's one of the outcomes we care about. But what you can see here, the reason there are different colors is people travel along. This is one of the highway interchanges um, in, in Ann Arbor, in, in South Ann Arbor. What you can see here is just the different colors are different types of trips. So uh, you might have picking up and dropping off or commuting to work or going to school or doing shopping. And we wanted to track that to try and understand some of these, again, equity outcomes we're interested in. Um, to think about the ma micro macro vehicles, um, I'm just gonna walk you through uh, what, what is gonna happen with a micro macro, just to explain that concept a little bit better. If you're here in a, in a mi micro vehicle and you wanna take a trip to somewhere else in Ann Arbor, you're just gonna drive directly there. So you, know, you can drive on residential roads, you don't need to go on the highway, you're not going far away. Um, but we have an algorithm, a clustering algorithm that if you need to go further away, it makes the decision that you need to go further away and it uh, clusters you with other people that are going somewhere nearby yours. And based on the demand at that time creates a dynamic macro stop uh, here and over here in which you will drive to what is now basically a bus stop. You will drive your electric vehicle to that point. The micro vehicle will board. You'll wait for everybody else to board and then you'll drive to the other macro stop and everyone will get off and then drive to their individual destination. So the first mile, last mile is happening in the micro vehicle, whereas the macro vehicle is doing that sort of high speed highway travel. Um, this is a clustering, clustering algorithm that we did. And it's, it's analogous to you taking your, riding your bike to a bus stop and getting on the bus. And so I'll just show you a simulation of that happening. So we'll take a short second here. So you can see the light colored uh, dots, and hopefully this is big enough, 
are the micro vehicles. So these ones over here are getting onto that macro vehicle, which is the dark color. They were assigned to that through our, our clustering algorithm based on the available demand. And then it's going to travel on this high speed. And I think I'm gonna speed it up here. So we're not all day watching this, this one commute. But you're gonna travel on that highway and then come to a single another stop. Now, one of the differences between our concept and most of anything else that you read about modular transportation is that we actually don't have fixed stops. So we take the demand at any given point in time and have some of this dynamic stop location to again, adjust for that shifting demand that we heard about from the stakeholders. So here they're getting off and then that same macro vehicle gets assigned to new micro vehicles and goes to a new stop that was calculated at that time. Um, okay, let's see if we can go to the next slide. So what are the, the results from this? So you know, based on our simulation, and again, uh, our simulation, uh, what we found from it is that there are longer trips are improved in the micro macro scenario. So the further away you're going, uh, the micro macro, what you would expect is that there'd be less congestion, but you have to wait for that macro vehicle to show up. So there's a trade off. And the further away that you're going, the further that you're commuting or taking a trip, uh, the better it is for you in the macro micro macro case. Uh, sensitivity analysis showed that the top speed of the micro vehicles was actually really important and also the population density. So as we get more people, the micro macro starts to make more sense because it is less susceptible to congestion because the vehicles are small. One of the reasons being that the vehicles are smaller. Um, the docking time is a crucial parameter. So you know the longer it takes for you to dock, uh, the longer it's going to, to be on your trip. But the main thing I wanted to bring up was some of the system congestion behavior. So what we did was we were able to, because of how we track the different types of trips, we're able to look at a subset of the demand, which was like really high congestion. And we determined something to be high congestion if your trip took two hours longer than Google Maps thought it was going to, right? So if like with zero traffic, it would take you 15 minutes. If it actually took you 30 minutes in our, in our simulation, we said you ran into traffic that was high congestion for you, right? For that particular trip. So when we look at those trips, we're gonna plot on this graph, the total tra travel time here on the bottom axis and the number of trips that took that amount of travel time and ran into high congestion. So what you can see here, this is the uh, passenger vehicles. So the passenger vehicles, they had the ones that ran into traffic took on average about 43 minutes, but they had sort of this big spread. There were people that were took their total trip was 100 minutes, but should have been 50 minutes, right? When we look at those same trips, because we were in the simulation able to keep the demand the same, we just look at those exact same trips if everybody was using our micro micro concepts. And what we can see is that the mean drops by about half and it's the variation is a lot less, right? So the people that were running into traffic in the passenger vehicle simulation are really saving a lot of time in the micro macro. Now the micro macro overall uh, costs you about 30 to 40 seconds. So it's not a huge part of your trip. So everyone's going a little bit slower because you're in these slower vehicles but you're running into traffic less, off, less, less often and not as much traffic. Um, you might say, okay, well, maybe these are just the winners and losers. Uh, you know, when you switch to micro macro, there's people that run into congestion in the micro macro case. And when we look at those trips, the first thing to notice is that the frequency of the trips goes down by an order of magnitude, okay? So before there were about 30,000 trips that were running into high congestion out of 900,000. And now there are about 3,000. And so this is the, the micro macro trips that were running into congestion. And what you can see is the passenger ones, again, have a higher variation, even though the average is less. So you save a little bit of time if you ran into congestion in the micro macro case, um, the variation was higher. The result from this is just that the potential impact of switching to a micro macro concept, and this is what we went back to the stakeholders with, was everyone's commute is gonna be a little bit slower because you have to either wait for the macro vehicle or you're in this small you know, two person smart for two light car that can only go 45 miles an hour. Um, but you don't run into traffic as often, right? So that's the trade-off that we're seeing. And the important thing is to understand using our approach, what are those trade-offs in the design decisions that you're making? Um, so that was future modular transportation concepts. I'm now going to talk about a similar approach that we took to look into uh, informal e-waste recycling in Northern Thailand. And again, I, what I want you to take away from the modular transportation is not 
yes, we should switch to micro macro. This is this amazing new modular transportation concept. It's more, hey, we can use this approach to try and understand what cities are good for micro macro concepts. What cities should we explore that in, right? Because we can understand how the context in our approach, we can understand how the context changes throughout this and we know what objectives are important to the stakeholders. All right, so we're now gonna switch over to Northern Thailand. And if you don't know what e-waste is, um, e-waste is anything that has electronic components in it and is waste, so we threw it out. Um, and uh, you might be thinking of your phone, your cell phone, your, your uh, computer, old computer that you have stuck in a drawer somewhere. Um, like I do, I have like six computers in a drawer. Uh, and, and, and instead, the most volume of e-waste is actually things that just have motors in them electric motors or other electrical components. So things like fans, refrigerators, washing machines, this make up the bulk of e-waste. And in many countries, uh, including Thailand, waste pickers collect these from, from landfills, sell them to informal e-waste recycling firms who demanufacture, so take apart these, these pile of e-waste in order to recover expense, you know, valuable materials such as copper, steel, or plastic. Um, you can see here, a worker going ahead and they're taking that apart, that electric motor from a, from a fan in order to be able to get the copper out and collect it and sell it to a recycler. So again, I, I wanna just get back to the main question I started this talk with, which is we see this problem and this was brought to us by the School of Public Health here at University of Michigan, where they had an ongoing project, a collaboration with the university in Thailand where they were evaluating the public health impact of informal e-waste recycling. They said, look, this is a real problem. We don't know what to do about it. They came to me and they said, Jesse, we know that you work in international development. Is there something that we could do, some intervention, some widget, something we could make? We want a solution to this problem. And uh, you know, the question for me always is like, okay, well, we want the solution to have a sustainable impact. How do we think about it? And Again, my approach is how do we get to that system level view? We want to understand how the design decisions we might make about any change in this demanufacturing process, how that would affect at the system level outcomes that the stakeholders care about. So the first thing to know is that the informal e-waste recyclers are not monolithic. They're actually in these inform organized into informal firms of three to five people of which there's an employer. And I'm going to show you a picture because they're going to become important later. So there's an employer that has three to five people working for them that they pay on a daily basis. They demanufacture everything and the employer actually works with the, with the employees. And then the employer is the one that's getting the profit from the firm, right? So they're paying a daily rate. They're actually connected to the e-waste recycler. They're buying from them. They're connected to the mid-tier recycler. That's who they're selling to. If we zoom out even further, you're gonna have the mid municipal waste, the top tier recycler in Bangkok that that mid-tier recycler is shipping to. Uh, you have the end user who's generating the waste. Um, you have a government ministry that's regulating all of this, right? And if we zoom out even further, again, if we want to understand the sustainability of any change here, we know it's going to be affected by these other relationships. So you have the OEM who's making the, the, the thing, who the artifact, who is distributing this e-waste. Uh, well, these artifacts that become e-waste. Uh, other government industries that are interested in the community members and the public health, which is how we even became involved in the project in the first place. So if we think about that from an engineering perspective and what I have done in the past is really think about this as a recycling system. So I'm gonna do stakeholder mapping. I'm gonna do all these things to try and understand the recycling system. But one of the important things, and there are many other systems that are gonna connect with it, is you can actually have, you saw the health system was an important piece of this, right? So. If we want to understand the public health outcomes of these e-waste workers, we need to understand the health system that they're operating in. And if we want to understand the trade-off between the health outcomes and the money that they're making, which is why they're choosing to do this dangerous work, uh, we need to understand the economic system and how the macroeconomic system might change the behavior of stakeholders within the recycling system. Now, there are many other systems, the educational system, the labor system, the legal system. Um, we're going to focus on, on these three right now because they were important to our project. And we really need to get that system level view to understand that relationship between those interactions and the technical performance of whatever intervention that we're going to give. Um, particularly, we're interested in how multiple stakeholders impact product success. So in this case where you have a firm, the employer is actually responsible for purchasing the tools and the employee is responsible for using the tools. And we've seen from prior work that uh, if you have a mismatch there, whatever tool you produce might never get used. 
right? So it might never get bought in the first place, or even if it is bought, it might never get used. So you really need to think about what do these multiple stakeholders want? And then finally, how do we validate these designs? We don't want to go to Thailand, spend all this money, spend all this jet fuel to fly to Thailand if we're, if we're going to make something that's not going to, to end up uh, being used, right? And we want to validate that our design decisions are good. So I showed you these three systems. That was on purpose because that represented the collaborators that we had. So we had the School of Public Health uh, originally approach us to bring us into this project. But then based on our interactions with them, we said, look, the economic system is really important. Let's bring a development econo economist in from the Ross Business School here at the University of Michigan, as well as other public health collaborators at Mayfa Lung University in Northern Thailand and in uh, Chiang Rai. And we really want to try and answer these questions all at the same time, right? And so this is really important to us that when we're making engineering design decisions, that we're understanding the potential impact, not just in the recycling system, under sort of our mechanical engineering aegis, but also in public health and development economics. So we did a case study in order to try and work out this methodology. And we did a classic user needs identification. So we did, again, this was multidisciplinary. So the public health uh, investigators, the economists, uh, this is me and my grad student talking to an e-waste worker um, that's talking about how they take apart a washing machine in order to get the motor. We did an analysis of not only the engineering processes, but also a market analysis and the public health risks uh, during multiple field visits to Northern Thailand. What we identified as the opportunity we wanted to work on in this project was the disassembly of the stator. So the copper recovery, very valuable. And what you can see here is an e-waste worker, they're using a lawn edger blade. I don't know if anyone has used a motorized lawn edger, but it's hardened tool steel. They're just holding it in their hands and hammering it through the steel plates of a stator from an electric motor in order to cut it in half and pull, be able to pull out the copper wire to collect to sell to those mid-tier recyclers. Uh, this is a high health risk. So doing the analysis of the public health of all of the different things that we looked at, this was one of the higher health risks in terms of injuries to the hand, repetitive stress injuries, noise injuries, and, and also was a break point in the demanufacturing process I did participatory co-design uh, on this. So I was out there, you know, cutting apart staters, a bunch of staters. So we, we did some days working uh, demanufacturing staters and it's really, really hard. Obviously I'm not very good at it. The e-waste the e workers were better, but it was still really slow compared to the other tasks that they were doing. So what we came up with in response to that, uh, working collaboratively with e-waste workers, with our Thai uh, academic collaborators and our collaborators here at Michigan, we came up with this idea of saying, okay, well, let's add a handle and a guard, like a safety guard, move the hand away from where we're hitting with the hammer, uh, give it some sort of cushion and sort of protect it um, and be able to reduce or mitigate some of these outcomes that we're thinking about. Now, it's great to come up with this idea. Okay, you know, I, we came up with this idea, we have a nice CAD model, but we wanna be able to evaluate this and say, is there actually a potential public health benefit or health benefit for these workers or economic benefit? We wanna understand all those impacts because we know that any change we make won't be sustainable unless we can understand or at least convince ourselves of potential positive impact. So to do that, we did a conjoint analysis, which comes from uh, marketing but is used in engineering design fairly widely now. We did uh, a study actually using physical prototypes. Um, and the way you think about conjoint analysis, trying to understand the utility function uh, based off of attributes. So you can see here, we show people a random set of these physical prototypes say, can you rank these in order if they were based on different prices and people, we try and then statistically draw out a, a preference function. We actually came up with a new way of thinking about uh, whether stakeholders agreed on what was a good design. And because we wanted to understand how the employees and the employers preferred any particular design, we came up with what we call the stakeholder agreement metric, which optimizes a preference function that we estimate using conjoint analysis for both stakeholder groups, and then looks at the distance in the design space between the optimal designs. So if the optimal designs are really close together, we say, look, these two stakeholders were in agreement that this is a pretty good design. If it's far apart, we're like, they're in disagreement. So it's less about what you dislike and it's more about what you like, right? How far apart you are. Based on that, and there was high agreement based on our, our metric that we came up with, uh, we did some pilot manufacturing. So we made 150 of these. We did, we modified a technique from uh, development economics, which is a Becker-Dukrit 
I'm going to pronounce that horribly because I'm, I'm not Dutch, uh, Marshak auction, which is a way of estimating willingness to pay uh, that's more rigorous than what we normally do in conjoint analysis. And so you basically get people to bid on whether they can spend their fake money on household goods that are priced as they are in the market versus our tool. And in doing so, we actually can naturally lead to a randomized control trial of the implement usage, economic benefit and health outcomes, and we can control for willingness to pay. So we were able to look at all of these outcomes, economic outcomes, health outcomes, um, in a way that inform our design decisions. So uh, we wrote some papers on this. There's a one we just submitted to development engineering on the conjoint representations. And then the stakeholder agreement metric was invited to a, a uh, invited to submit to the Journal of Mechanical Design based on our conference paper. Um, and, and so that's, that's in review right now. At the end of the day, what did the system level view get us? What did spending all of that time collaborating with public health, collaborating with the economists or anybody else get us? Well, number one, it got us some publications, that's great. Um, but in terms of impact, we think that we came up with a better design. The willingness to pay was three times what people would pay uh, for a blade in the market right now. And when we went back, the we did see uh, the majority of the people were still using the blade at the at the one month survey. Our future end line survey was interrupted by COVID. Um, but at that one month point, people were still, almost everybody was still using it, except for people that had used it so much it broke, which gets back to our local manufacturing. We're gonna have to revisit on this, this iteration, but it's really exciting that people were even still using it and not just sort of telling us that they liked it and then never looking at it again, right? Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, I'm almost out of time, so I just wanna wrap up here with this. How do we create solutions that have sustainable impact? Well, I think the key is to think about how we can connect decisions that we make during our design methods and our design strategies to the usage at a system level of the economic impact, the environmental impact, and the social impact. Right, so these sustainability outcomes, which these design decisions early on really do affect greatly. And I think we have to collaborate in a multidisciplinary way with other disciplines and change our engineering processes in order to get uh, artifacts and systems that interact in their context and that we understand ahead of time what is the potential benefit uh, along those sustainability axes. So whether it's a demanufacturing tool for Northern Thailand, whether it's a future mobility system, and we're looking at what cities might this have a, a sustainable impact in, or we're looking at bird scooters and we wanna avoid people with limited visions and their canes running into random objects on the sidewalk, or have people throwing these scooters into the Charles. You know, we wanna think about these system, you know, un what we now call unintended system level outcomes we want to be able to, in our design decisions, be saying, hey, we're thinking about this now and understanding how this might interact with all of these stakeholders. And really the performance is at that point, not when we go and sell it. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, you know, reveal what my system was, right? So uh, this work was not done by me in a vacuum. Um, so we have academic collaborators from Chile, from, as I said, Meifei Luang University in Thailand, also a bunch of departments here at Michigan. We have industry collaborators that work with us on, on these projects. We have a community of people, um, ASME, the Engineering for Change organization. I really wanna shout out, we have a virtual uh, seminar series every month. It's the second Wednesday of every month at noon. Please look for it on the E4C website. Uh, I moderate that and we really try and have a community of people interacting and building because we think the system level, you have to understand other people's perspective in order to get good engineering answers. Um, and similarly, at a local level, Blue Lab and the Center for Socially Engaged Design. And over here are some of my PhD and master's and undergrad students who have contributed to the work that, that you've seen. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that have come up. Hopefully, I'm on time. I think that pretty close to 45 minutes. And uh, thank you very much for listening and, and your attendance on a Friday at four before Thanksgiving. Uh, I know we're all not traveling anywhere, but uh, I really appreciate you spending your time with me today. So thank you. Jesse, fantastic. Thank you very much. This was awesome. Um, there's a few questions that already came out. And the first one was Professor Amos Winter. So I'll allow him to unmute or he should be able to do this himself. 
and hopefully you can ask ask his question sure. himself. Yes, I can I can ask it in real life. Um, Jesse, my first question is um, about the micro macro uh, transportation scenario, and just about the logistics of how users would provide data on where they are and where they want to go, uh, so you can plan the most efficient routes. Um, and maybe that's as easy as like Google Maps and GPS. But then, uh, have you thought about how long it would how it would take to calculate a route? and how robust that decision would be depending on reliability and participation of the micro vehicles. Yeah, so uh, there's, I think, multiple levels of detail with which we could answer that question, Amos. Um, I think we were trying to answer a pretty specific question from the uh, you know, OEM that approached us with this concept of like, should we even invest resources in trying to answer some of the technical challenges like the ones that you're bringing up, right? Um, and whether there's any potential benefit or value to this type of system. And that's what we were trying to make our simulation answer. Um, but to answer your question a little bit, we did spend a lot of time really working out the decision between deciding to drive a, a micro vehicle yourself to the end destination versus getting assigned a macro vehicle and going to, to, to that new bus stop, getting on the macro vehicle and going there. Because it's actually not you don't know ahead of time what the traffic's going to look like, right? And so there is this latency to what is the time step, what's the optimal time step with which you're looking at demand and assigning using this clustering algorithm. There are different clustering algorithms that we tried. Um, there are different thresholds at which we said, hey, our estimated difference was such that we think you should take the macro vehicle or not. Um, I think the important thing, we were looking for first order effects on the design decisions as to what, make, what might make this system better. And I think the key thing is you want your top speed of your vehicle. Most of the battery operated electric vehicles at the moment go 37 miles an hour in order to be able to go on sort of residential streets. But if you enable your car to go 45 miles an hour, it opens up what streets you can go on and how fast you can go on those roads. And the whole system performs a lot better in terms of congestion and total time travel. So I think that there is optimization and a lot of work to be done. What our work showed was actually that for many cities, for certain types of cities, this doesn't have a real good impact, right? Like this type of concept, like you really even shouldn't try to answer it because even in sort of the simplified case that we were solving, um, there wasn't a lot of benefit, but there are many cities in the US in which we think it is valuable to try and explore this type of concept. There are lots of other challenges, Amos. For example, what is the efficiency of carrying actual vehicles on another vehicle? You have a lot of weight that's not people, right? Um, so there are other things that need to be in the, in the battery size and, and, and reliability. There's a lot of technical challenges to, to be solved. And we were really trying to understand sort of what are these, these system level ones. So hopefully that, that answered your question. Hey, Jesse. There's a couple of other ones. Uh, I have a couple of them in the Q&A here. Uh, one from an anonymous attendee. Uh, first of all, thank you for the great talk. And in terms of implementation, how you make this happen with the, with the, uh, with the micro macro vehicles, um, that would require a significant infrastructure and would work if everyone uses it. In your yeah. term, how would you compare this with the systems like ride share systems versus full public transport systems like Korea, Singapore, or China? Sure. So uh, I think what we were trying to look at was the ability, some of the characteristic differences. So again, there's this assumption like, okay, what if everybody uses this and we have perfect usage and we have perfect information and all of these things? In that case, is it even worth it is sort of the question that we were trying to answer with this research, right? So this is not um, a realistic concept in the sense of like, this is not gonna be rolled out tomorrow. I do agree that there's uh, infrastructure in terms of the vehicles themselves. When I said there wasn't infrastructure changes, I meant in terms of when you look at a lot of uh, future transportation concepts that are out there right now, they involve building sort of new roads. And we were talking, I should have been more precise and said road infrastructure, uh, not changing, right? So you need a lot of other infrastructure to change. But the road, we wanted to use the existing road network that we don't have to tear this up and change where people live or have new lanes of highways that have certain technology that enable this, right? Um, so that was just an assumption that we were making. I think that when you look at the future of transportation, one of the things that's really challenging and that I think uh, I would encourage anybody that is working on transportation and mobility to look at 
is this question of equity, right? So most of the papers that you read, most of the concepts that are being put out there, let's just say ride sharing. So Uber is great. And actually you can do it because it's being subsidized by investors at the moment. You can, I did the calculation. It's cheaper to ride Uber for me every day on most of the trips that I make than own a car, right? So if I just Ubered everywhere, it would be cheaper than my yearly cost of car ownership, right? Which is crazy, right? So it's like, why doesn't everyone use Uber? Well, the thing is, is that if everything changes to so everyone ha is using these ride share systems, um, there's a lot of people that are priced out of it, right? So the transportation equity and social impact and what does our society look like if rideshare is the only thing that's available or is the majority of transportation? Um, these are some of the system level outcomes that we think aren't being addressed. And as engineers, I think we have a sort of ethical responsibility to say, I'm designing something and if we win, and it all gets out there, what happens? And I include this micro macro concept as part of that, which is why we were trying to provide information about, well, these types of households, what is the level of service for these types of trips that we're, we're looking at? Thank you. Um, there's another question from Dr. Adidi Verma. And um, I was wondering if, oh. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, Sorry. I can ask, thank you can you ask it yourself, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Jesse. That was a really interesting talk. I really liked how you um, sort of laid out a big picture question and how you make these individual level design decisions for system level sustainability and impact. And I'm just wondering how you would think about achieving uh, sustainable and equitable design in this way uh, for technologies that are being designed and put into the world for the very first time, technology services or systems, uh, because it's often the case that until things are designed and sort of out there, uh, there's no real demand or need or even market uh, for it, because sometimes you, you truly can't know who the users are going to be. And so in, in, that, in that situation, I just wonder, is there a way to think about what sustainable and equitable design looks like, or are we sort of doomed um, to end up with inequitable um, technologies the first time we put them out into the world? Sure, so that's a great question and a lot to unpack there. So I'm gonna try and tackle it in two stages. The first one is the question about being able to predict new novel technologies where you don't have market history or a lot of understanding of potential system impact. So I think that that's really true. Like new technologies, we don't know how people are gonna use them. There are going to be unintended uses. Um, however, I think that there, I would say that you should be building your pilot studies, your testing, your prototyping should include some of these outcomes. So you say, hey, before we deploy this at a really large scale, before I put scooters in every, you know, 17 cities in the United States, maybe I should be doing some testing and, and measuring what are some of these other sustainability outcomes before I deploy it sort of in the wild. And I would argue that, um, uh, it's it's pretty it's it's pretty wild wild west and sort of autonomous delivery vehicles at the moment, which is one of the things we were looking at in this micro macro vehicle case uh, in terms of benchmarking. And it's like we have autonomous vehicles on the roads right now, delivering packages and vehicle uh, food and other things in a way that there isn't a lot of knowledge of what some of these potential things are. Um, and especially, I don't think that the engineers even had any framework for saying what are the questions we should be asking. Right. Um, and I think that's an important thing. You might not know or have an extremely highly validated model to make some of these predictions of the things that I'm talking about. Um, but for novel technologies, we don't even know that for technical performance, but we do prototyping, we do testing to try and determine that technical performance and, and validate some of the guesses that we make. And I think we should be doing the same thing along these other uh, impact out outcomes, um, particularly social impact. The other thing I would say is that I think that there are other disciplines that really do think about this potential for things that don't exist yet, right? So working with people in public health, working with people in economics, working with people in sociology and anthropology and you know, uh, science, technology and public policy, for example, they're thinking about what are the potential social impacts of some technology change, right? And I think we can bring some of that thinking into our engineering models to help us make design decisions. And I think that it's really important that we start to change engineering 
from thinking about some of these sort of product level decisions and just technical performance outcomes to some of these system level outcomes. And it's really hard. I'm not going to lie to you. That's why I think it's a research question, right? Like, I don't think that there's an easy answer. We can just say, yes, I'm going to think about system level. Here's the answer. I think that it takes a lot of time and energy and resources. Um, but I think that we're opening ourselves up to uh, some real issues when we just sort of deploy things without thinking about them. Good, thank you. I think there's a couple of other questions coming in, so it's, it's going getting pretty lively. Uh, Professor Warren Searing is the next one who had, I think, one or two questions that he wanted to ask you. A cutting question. I'm probably not going to have a good answer. Let's let's. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, sure. you know, hi, hi, Jesse. Good to see you. Um, um, first of all, I just want to point out that our football team has a better record than yours because we're 0-0. I think we should never have gone back to playing. I mean, I don't know why we advocated for Big Ten starting again. I was advocating against it. I, I mm. thought this was going to happen. <laughs> mm. So um, you, you mentioned in your title about understanding people. And to me, that often means having a predictive model of some sort. I'm just wondering what sorts of representations do you find useful when you're trying to understand people? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that I... I take a more holistic approach. So we, in the stakeholder agreement metric, you saw we were using conjoint analysis and we were representing people using a preference function on attributes, right? But that's in conjunction with a sort of designer synthesis, uh, more qualitative work, personas, mm -hmm. other things that we were doing in the design work mm -hmm. um, and doing co-design, meaning working with those e-waste workers on potential concepts. So we showed them a bunch of concepts. We said, look, what if we worked on fixturing? What if we worked on, on you know, uh, a cleaning tool? What if we worked on a cutting tool um, and different ones? And so we were working with them in sort of that more traditional, holistic, qualitative design work that happens where the designer is synthesizing a lot of the, the observations and trying to gain insights into the user and represent those explicitly. We're connecting that to some more of these quantitative ones where you're using sort of uh, choice analysis or conjoint analysis to try and explicitly represent them as a, their preferences as a preference function. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you need to do both in my view. Um, I think one area which I'm really excited about and uh, I think I didn't talk as much about but you can sort of see as a basis is this idea of stakeholder mapping. So we talk about stakeholder mapping a lot but we don't have really great whether quantitative or even qualitative tools to represent different contexts and different stakeholder interactions. And what we see from other fields, particularly economics in the case of these manufacturing interventions, that those interactions really determine the adoption and usage of some of these, these artifacts and systems. And so um, I'm really interested in developing new ways of, in engineering, representing sort of stakeholder interactions. And I'm not sure that we have great ones yet. Yeah. Um, and just a quick follow-up, and this is sure. a little bit wonky, but you started it. Um, sure, I, let's get into it. You, you mentioned in, in a design space that um, designs might have proximity or you know, be close together or farther apart. I'm, I'm curious to know um, what the architecture of your design space is. Are the axes form? Are they function? Are they need? Are they market yeah. potential? Are they sustainability? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what does proximate mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So there's there's a couple different uh, assumptions that when you look at our paper, like we try and be explicit about. So one of the things is who cares how close they are if people dislike things that are really like if you change one value and then it's like that's the value I need to have a particular uh, you know number at. Like if my preferences are not smoothly varying over the design phase, like proximity doesn't matter, right? right. Um, the other assumption that goes into this, so we were doing it based off of the attribute space, right? So attributes that were defined earlier on. Um, and so part of our frameworks, you have to define that attribute space. And we were doing that because that's what conjoint analysis is based off of, right? Mm -hmm. So conjoint analysis is saying, let's try and understand people's like the marginal utility of changing different ones. That assumes uh, you know, some level of varying in terms of what the, the surface looks like for the interactions between the different axes. Um, so it wouldn't be neat. It would be, uh, I guess, form in the way that you were talking about it, because it is the attribute space um, that I was talking about in that paper. I don't think that's the only way we should do about it. And it was one that we proposed. Um, but I think the important question, more important than my answer to it, is the question of 
how do we understand what design decision we should make when multiple people are interacting with this artifact in different ways and we can only design one artifact, right? Mm. So if I have to satisfy multiple people, um, I don't think we have good frameworks for thinking about it. This was one way that we proposed, um, but you know, I think there's a lot more needs to be done to validate it as even a, what, like we did an empirical validation of it that showed like people like these two same things and they had similar preferences and willingness to pay and usage. But, um, you know, we would have to test a lot more cases to say that the metric itself was valid across a wide range of cases. Mm. Thank you, Jesse, it's really good. Jesse, there's a few more questions, but I also want to say thank you to all the attendees, first of all, because we run a bit over time. Uh, it's been amazing that you all joined us and Jesse, it's been an amazing talk. I will let the two questions go if you don't mind, if you still have um, time. Cool, Absolutely. perfect. And so please everyone stick around if you want to know more. Um, stay here for informal discussions, but otherwise have a great weekend. And now let's get to these two questions that are still here. And I think Adi is the first one. If you can and want to talk, I'll just allow you speaking and otherwise I can also read the question. So let's see, Adi, do you want to say the question yourself or do you want me to take it? Uh, so if it's the one that's on the Q and A in the chat, um, it's, on, I can it's that. actually on the on the chat. Yeah. Yeah. So the one about Boeing Max. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I can so I can read it so everybody knows it. Sure. So the, the question is, how can your techniques be employed to use design issues, or to 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 essentially address design issues like what happened with Boeing Max, and how do you make a choice between engine weight and allowing a sensor or computer to compensate for the design efficiency? So on a more general question. When you have different optimization metrics, how do you structure them? Yeah, yeah. So this is a this is a great question that I think. So you know, I teach a design optimization course. Uh, we were using optimization, design optimization. I say that's that's what we do. Making optimization practical, design optimization practical, is really really difficult. And I think we have a long way to go. We have a lot of knowledge about the mathematical techniques, the the mathematics behind using these techniques, but using them to answer real world problems. I think the question there is, what is your objective function? Right? How do you write your objective function when you have multiple objectives, you have multiple constraints? And especially in the case of the Boeing Max, you have these interactions that are almost impossible to model. Right, You don't have a single model of the entire airplane with all of the interactions in a single optimization. Right, You're doing multiple nested optimizations. Maybe you're not optimizing things. You have hard targets. Um, you know, We've done a lot of work with like large complex systems, and complex systems are hard because of this complexity, right? It's nonlinear interactions that are highly coupled, right? So it's very hard to model. Um, one of the things that I think um, I would respond to that question with is, A, I think it's really interesting to think about the organization and how decisions are made within that organization and sort of the social technical aspects of the organization itself, right? So to me, it's less about, hey, I can put this math problem together that helps me solve the Boeing max issue right that would predict that it was going to be an issue in the first place but i think that what we can do is start to think about how are these teams put together how are they communicating and what are the objectives of the stakeholders within the organization that lead to higher levels of of failure or catastrophic failure as in the case of the boeing max right and so some of my other work uh which i didn't present on today um we actually do that so we use similar simulations and qualitative interviews to examine how organizations as a system within themselves uh, have these types of things. And one of the things we found is that um, networked miscommunication is, is a real problem, right? So if you have miscommunication in some of these stakeholder interactions within your organization, um, you can have some of the system level catastrophic failure that you can affect by having interventions on that communication lower down in, in sort of the chain. Um, and I'd love to have like five hours to talk about that because we have a lot of, a lot of thoughts on that. But um, I think that's what I would start to say is that it's less about the physical system itself, but about the social technical system of the company making it. And I think we're already starting to see with Boeing some of the failures of the incentives and the way people uh, communicated and designed things, which led to that type of failure. If you do another five hours, then everybody has to get a bottle of wine and, yeah. and be comfortable. <laughs> 
there is one more question. I think that's a bit controversial, and I don't know if you, I don't know how to pose it right and how you want to answer this. But the question is, when do you sort of intervene in an industry that is yeah. sort of oh, totally dirty versus sort of changing the whole industry? Yeah. So here, here is what I would say. I would say that um, I think uh, I'm going to generalize the question in a different way. So I'm going to use it to make the following point. I think that. I, what I am pushing engineering to do, what I would like to push engineers to do is to consider collaborating with other disciplines so that we can think about what interventions achieve the impact that we want. So I was designing one tool to try and address this question. It was a very small project and it was actually, we did it small to try and work out some of the methodologies around working together as a collaboration. It's an ongoing project, right? I don't think this is the answer to e-waste problems. Right. I don't think our tool is going to, you know, solve poverty. Right. Um, what I do think is that when we work on technologies and developing technologies, there are often structural issues, which is what I think are being brought up by the question here, which mean that almost no matter what I do, maybe I can't have the impact that I want. Right. So if the intended impact is to reduce, let's say, public health risk. If the public health risk is actually by the existence of this in the first place, and it should just be regulated away at the OEM level, um, maybe that's the only, and I should know that as an engineer and not spend time trying to come up with a knife or a chisel that can improve the local conditions, right? And so I think this is the type of thinking when we decide on what problems to work on and what solutions could potentially have the impact that we want. I think currently we don't have great tools for making that decision around what are the structural barriers um, or other sort of structural or systemic interactions that might affect the sustainability of our intervention, right? So um, I would say that's a really great question that I don't know the answer to. I know that I, I was working with our collaborators in Chile to look at the legal framework around which this informal system was becoming formalized, right? Um, and whether, you know, you could regulate it away, but it might not, you need enforcement, but then there's all these other things that come into it, right? Including what do these people do for jobs once you get rid of the industry, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's an incredibly complicated question. And I would say engineering, I would encourage, or what I'm trying to do, is not only develop tools to help design teams think about this, is this the right opportunity? Is this the right solution? But I think we want people to go beyond delivering a technology and having it being purchased. We want them to go to, okay, once you have it, does that actually have the impact that we want? And you know, maybe the design decision is not to make this in the first place. Like that's a perfectly valid design decision, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe they're correct, I don't know. And I think that we're working on trying to understand whether that's true or not. Uh, thank you. Um, I think we have gotten to the bottom of all the questions. Really nice session also on the questions and, and beautiful talk. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Matthias, and everybody for listening and staying afterwards. I really appreciate your time. Uh, in Under the pandemic situation, that's our most precious resource. So to have you spend it with me, uh, really, really exciting. And, and I'm grateful to all of you for doing that. Fantastic. And at this point, we can put everybody in the panel if you still want to talk with, with Jesse. If there's any other questions, um, I'm happy to make everybody a panelist. So I think everybody should be able to ask if they still want to ask questions in person. That's sort of the like coming to your presentation after the official part is over and now people asking yeah. you individual questions. We'll see if some of that happens. At least I wanted to give people a chance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Cool. All right. Jesse, I have one, one question um, sure. that I want to ask you. Uh, that, that is on my mind. Um, how do you do these interviews? I think it's a it's a sort of more subtle question and uh, it sort of popped up and you showed that you had these semi-structured interviews, but yeah. but how do you decide on I have to interview this person and this is how I go about to get the maximum information, right? Because there's a lot of subjectivity and and and, and touchy feely potentially, if that's the right word. 
but how do you make yeah, so, it out of this? So um, here's how I would describe it. First of all, we collaborate in my grad students. Uh, some of the grad students that are doing this are in the design science program. So they're co-advised by people in another school. Um, so they have to be rigorous about the techniques that they're using. I think that there are uh, you know, standards and best practices for doing these qualitative uh, interviews and extracting design information, whether that's design ethnography or um, we don't do anthropology because you have to live in the place for three years for it to be valid in anthropology. So we don't do that. Uh, but we do do, you know, we do get training in or collaborate with people that are experts in those in those areas, right? Um, I think the thing I would answer, so you, your question had a lot to it, obviously, we try and follow best practices. That's the first thing, yeah. right? So we go to the people that really do this all the time for their job and we say, okay, how can we reconcile those methods with our needs as engineering, right? Because the information that's being gathered by ethnographers may not be the information that we need as designers, right? And so we're doing research on different tools and things that might um, reconcile those two, two different viewpoints into a sort of a coherent protocol. Um, so we write interview protocols for everything that we do. You know, we go through uh, coding exercises, code books. We have iterated reliability. We do lots of things to sort of, you know, do all of the qualitative front end design work in a rigorous way. Um, what I would say is, and what I was trying to answer with Warren maybe a little bit, is this idea of stakeholder mapping. So these networks of stakeholders. I don't think that like, I really see that as an open area for where we could do a lot of work, where what we do right now is we actually, um, and this is something that's, that's very, very new. So I, I didn't talk about it because we haven't really gotten into it, but we're looking at working with some of the system dynamics people um, and other people that work on what are representations of the system that the stakeholders themselves have, right? So for example, one of the things that we're trying to do now is look at if I ask all of the stakeholders in some system, and in this case, we're looking at like parents and teachers and uh, school officials and technology and all these things to think about technology in a virtual environment, like what we're doing right now in the pandemic, right? And we're saying, how do you view the system as, wh who do you think is in the system? What do you think are the important pieces of the system? And then we're comparing the representations of the system made with different stakeholders, right? And we're saying, do you have the same system model in your head as like the teacher does, or as the child does, or as the technology, the IT person does? You know, and so I think when you think about it that way, there's a lot of open space for developing new tools to try and understand what even is the system boundary, right? And then seeing if people believe the system boundaries are different, maybe you designing something is not going to have the effect that you want, right? Like you have as the designer, a certain system model in your head. Um, and so when we interview people, we often are asking things like, hey, let's draw a map of this system. Like what is going on? We want to achieve this outcome. What are the things that you think affects that? And then we use that to then say, okay, who else should we be interviewing, right? Um, and who else is in this system? Who should we talk to next, right? Um, so there's a lot there. I, I think there's a lot of quantitative work that can be done actually. I think that there's some really interesting, I saw one paper on using email as a way of generating network maps. Obviously we're in this big data, let's create social graphs, but we use it for targeting ads and not for engineering design, right? So in my view, it's like Google has all this information and they're using it for like Amazon basics. But, you know, I think it's, uh, it's questionable like whether they're really solving, like thinking about societal impact um, in what they're doing. Uh, you know, not if they want to fund me, absolutely, I'm on board. But, uh, you know, I think that we can all agree that there's there's definitely an opportunity for engineering designers to have better frameworks for thinking about who is in the system, how they view the system. And, and the important thing is, I think we've just moved beyond this, like marketing gives us specifications over the wall. And we go ahead and do that, right? If I'm an engineer, I need to be thinking about, you know, how is someone going to use this? And, you know, how is this going to affect the neighbor of the person that is using it, right? Yeah. Um, How is it going to affect the other people in the system? Because we're deploying these things at large scales in a connected way across like society in this way where we don't really know what's going to happen. And we haven't even thought about it, right? Thank you. Um...
you just open my eyes to how to think about it quantitatively in a sense, right? Because yeah. because when you when you think about these semi-structured interviews, there it's a lot of how do you distill quantitative data out of this, but the way how you described it, the, the mapping of stakeholders and 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 the way how to think about it in an engineering language. I didn't have this before you said it the way you said it. Uh, this is awesome. Yeah, well, that, I think, you know, I think that's a that's a problem and the one we're trying to solve, right? Like, I think that's a really, yeah. to me, was an insight when people started talking about social networks. I was like, oh, well, could we use this to understand, like, what's going on with you using, especially since a lot of our devices are connected to other people and the value is from in connecting to other people, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to understand the, the potential impact there. Awesome. Thank you for being our speaker today. This was fantastic. Yeah, no problem, Matthias. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, fantastic. Maria, as always, thank you for, for inspiring. Uh, <laughs> that was great. Really great. Great talk. Appreciate it. And uh, everyone else, if they're still there. Thank you much, Tony. So great. It all worked. No problems. Great to see you again, Professor. Interesting talk.